In this video, we look into RCNN, which is short for Regions with CNN Features. And this will be the first video in the Object Detection series. The plan for this series will be to go through all the seminal works in object detection in the past decade, all the way from RCNN to YOLO V8. For all of them, we'll try to understand every detail of the method and for some of them, we'll also follow up with an implementation from scratch. And the first one that we'll be starting with is RCNN. But before we look closely into RCNN, let's look at the object detection task first and see how it's different from other common tasks of vision. Let's start with the task of image classification, where the goal is to assign a class label to an image from a set of class categories defined in our dataset. These labels could also be multiple classes for an image, but for now, let's stick to single class label. Then there is the task of image localization, which demands a little bit more from us. It requires us to locate the instance of an object category in an image using a tight box centered on the instance. So essentially classification with single label plus locate the object. Now on to object detection, which further demands more. It requires us to locate all instances of all object classes in an image. And these classes, just like classification, come from a predefined set of categories present in our dataset. Let's also take a peek at these three from the architecture side as well. And for classification, again, let's stick to singular object of interest. We will typically have some CNN and after the feature maps, some FC layers and the last layer generates the classification scores for all categories present in our dataset. And we'll use cross-entropy loss to train it. For localization, we still need everything that we had for classification, except now we also need to predict this box, which we usually do via a different set of FC layers. For the box, our goal is to predict a very tight one around the object, such that it should cover the entirety of the object while keeping the box area as minimum as possible. So a box like this is not preferred because we are not covering the entire object. And a box like this is also not preferred because we are including regions of the image which we don't really need to. Also in most cases we predict access aligned boxes but there are some implementations that we'll see later on where we can predict boxes with arbitrary orientation. However, let's focus only on axis aligned ones for now. There are typically two ways to define these boxes. You could define it using the coordinates of the top left corner of this box, which is x1, y1, and the coordinates for the bottom right corner, x2, y2. Another way is that you use the xy coordinates of the center of the box and the width and the height of the box. Both of these can easily be converted to the other using this relation. And the values can either be pixel coordinates, so if your image width is 256, then x1 values can range from 0 to 256. Or scaled coordinates, so you could have x1 range from 0 to 1, where you are scaling the coordinates by dividing it by 256. Okay, back to localization. So our FC layers in localization task will predict these box coordinates in addition to the classification scores and they can be trained using something like MSE. For detection, we want to predict boxes for all instances of objects together with their respective classes. Let's just assume we are interested in predicting person and cars. Now you have to predict this person, but there could be another person here and another person here. And as part of object detection, you have to predict all these three. Building up from image classification tasks, one way to solve this would be to scan the entire image using windows of same size as this person. And for each window, we take the image crop belonging to that window and have our classification CNN say if this image crop belongs to a class that we are interested in or it's a background class. And after training this CNN, when a crop like this would be fed to it, it would predict with high confidence that it's a person class. So it's similar to a classification task, except rather than training the model on dataset images, we train it on these crops of our dataset images. But the same person could also be here or here, and you want to detect them as well. And while detecting, you again want to have a tight box. To achieve this, you would have to start taking crops of different sizes. 
Or you can take the same window size but start taking crops from downscaled version of images as well. Which means that crops from higher scale images would allow you to detect smaller size objects and crops from downscaled images would allow you to detect larger objects. But whether you scale boxes or scale the image, some component of scale will be there to increase the number of boxes that you need to handle for one single image. Now to detect these cars, you need slightly different square shaped crops. And to handle these cases, you again need altogether different shape crops. Which means that apart from scale of crops, you also want to handle crops of different aspect ratios. So if you combine all of this, because for a single image, we have to feed our classification CNN, crops of different scale, different aspect ratio, and windows corresponding to these crops would have to slide across the width and height of the image. The computational cost of classifying this huge number of crops will be a lot. You can reduce this by having your windows take strides greater than 1, but that cost still will be huge. With that background, let's see how RCNN handles this task. As of now, we have a lot of window crops and a deep network which will take these crops and predict a class label for them. And the problem that we are facing with this approach is that since we end up with too many crops, our computational cost is going to be high. If at this moment we are asked to somehow speed up this process, then there are two obvious ways that we could think of. Either speed up the deep network computation so fast that we can still manage to do this quickly with the same number of crops. So maybe we could start making the network shallower, but that will lead to more prediction errors. So that decrease in cost comes with a trade-off. The other approach could be to reduce the number of crops that we pass to CNN. In fact, some of the crops are very easy for us to know that it indeed does not contain any object. What if from all the crops we somehow were able to filter only those which possibly contain an object? Then we can pass this reduced number of crops to our CNN and as long as the set of crops still contain all the actual objects, we would have ended up reducing the computation cost without any trade-off in terms of accuracy of detection. RCNN follows this approach. Instead of using all the window crops, it offloads the task of finding out regions of image which possibly contain an object to some other method. This method would then propose certain regions in the image which it thinks could possibly contain an object and then we would do all the computations from here on forward only on these region proposals. The method that RCNN uses for this is selective search. And that's what we will look into next. Selective search is essentially a two-step process of generating proposals. We first segment the entire image into regions. The actual method uses graph segmentation for this. And then in step two, we merge these regions into larger regions. This allows us to get a hierarchy of regions which could potentially consist of an object. Let's look at the first step. I won't get into all the details, but here you start with assuming the image to be a graph with vertices being each of the pixels and edges indicating neighborhood of each pixels. And each edge has a weight measured by some sort of distance. It could be color difference, texture difference, or a combination of them or some other metric which captures this distance. So then maybe these nodes of being similar texture and color will be connected by an edge with a small weight and maybe these two because of say color difference would have an edge of larger weight. At the start of segmentation, every node is a component by itself and then we pick the two components with the smallest edge weight. And if the weight of the edge is less than some predefined threshold, we merge those two. The merged components now become one singular component. We keep on repeating this till there are no components that can be merged because all the edge weights between components are larger than our threshold. There are quite a few implementation details here, like how do you define edge weight, how you define neighborhood, what's the threshold criteria of merging two components, especially if there are multiple pixels present in that component, and so on. 
If you really want to understand all those technical details, I would suggest to check out the link that's mentioned in the description for graph segmentation, which is the one that Selective Search uses. For this image, maybe this could be the final set of components. The goal of graph segmentation is ultimately to partition the graph into components such that elements in one component are similar to each other and elements in different components are dissimilar. Which means edges between two nodes in the same component should have relatively lower weights and edges between nodes in different components should have higher weights. Running the first step of selective search on our image gives us this result. Now if you start wrapping each region with a box, you'll notice that these miss larger objects. Like look at the person segmentation. This is where the second step of selective search kicks in. Essentially, what this step does is it starts combining smaller and similar regions into larger regions until only one large region remains, giving us a hierarchy of regions. And all these regions can then be bounded with boxes to give us a set of region proposals capturing objects of small as well as large size. This merging of similar regions requires a notion of similarity and for this selective search uses multiple facets. Color similarity which will make regions of this t-shirt the person is wearing similar to each other. Texture similarity which maybe will make regions belonging to the trees more similar as they also have same color. Size similarity which captures that two smaller regions are more similar to each other than two larger regions. This ensures that the merge of two smaller regions happens first. And finally, shape similarity, which is a measure of how well two regions fit into each other. This ensures that nearby regions are merged first rather than far off. So if you have a region A and two neighboring regions B and C, since B is a better fit to A, these two will be merged first. The way Selective Search captures this notion is using the smallest box that covers both the regions. And then smaller the area present in that box outside of these regions, the higher becomes the similarity of these regions. This metric is what captures this similarity. So as we merge smaller regions, we could get an output looking like this. Where you can see first regions of trees are being merged. And as the merging progresses, we get larger and larger regions. These four similarity measures can be combined using different weights to give different strategies of merging. And you could also do this on the same image, but using different color spaces. Even the initial graph segmentation, you can have multiple variants by changing segmentation parameters like say threshold of similarity. The actual implementation of selective search uses an ensemble of these where for each image type, we fetch the different segmentation outputs and then use each of these strategies to merge the segmented regions differently and get different groups of objects. The selective search fast implementation, which RCNN authors use, deploys only a subset of these to get the region proposals faster. So after both these steps, here is a sample of proposals selective search gives. I have shown only a subset here for clarity as the method actually returns close to 1600 proposals for this image. Moving back to RCNN, the first step in RCNN is to extract these region proposals, which we have already seen. Post that, we end up with a classification network which classifies these proposals. And now, let's see how the authors of RCNN actually train this and what are all the intermediate steps involved in this. We first extract feature representations for these proposals. And for this, they train a deep convolutional network, AlexNet, on a large dataset for the image classification task. After this, we take the network and remove the last classification layer. And now, add a new classification layer which caters to classes present in our detection dataset. So if we have two classes, person and car, our final classify layer will have two output units plus another one for background. We are going to fine tune this entire network on the task of classifying region proposals into the appropriate class. But in order to be able to do that, two things need to be considered. First, 
AlexNet network accepts input to be of shape 227 cross 227. But our region proposals can be of any arbitrary shape. And second, in order to train this, we need to set the ground truth label for every proposal. For some proposals, it's easy. Like here, one is car and one is background. But what about this one or this one? Do we label it as a car or do we label it as background? Let's tackle the shape problem first. The authors do a simple resize transformation for this with some additional details. So given these proposals, we can convert them to our desired size. But the authors also dilate the box prior to resizing. So in the end, we still get 2 to 7 pixels. But they dilate the box in such a manner to ensure that the transformed box has exactly p pixels of context present in it. And in implementation, a value of 16 pixels is used for p. For cases where this additional context is not present, like if the box is already at the extreme boundary, in these cases, they use a padding of mean image pixels instead. The authors experimented with few other approaches, but this turned out to be what worked best for them. Now to the second aspect, where we need to figure out a mechanism to label the object. We use a metric called IOU, which stands for intersection over union, a common metric used in object detection. Given two boxes, IOU is measured by the area of intersection divided by the area of union of these two boxes. The range of IOU will be from 0 when there is no overlap to 1 when two boxes exactly overlap. And here are different box positions to give you a feel of how different IOU values look like. Now our dataset will have images where we know the ground truth box locations. And for this image, let's assume we only have two ground truth boxes. And these are the 1600 region proposals that selective search will return. For considering which of these are positive proposals, that is proposals belonging to non-background class, we select those proposals which have an IOU greater than 0.5 with any ground truth box. This gives us these. And everything else, that is all proposals, which do not have enough overlap with any ground truth box, become our background class proposals. Then to fine-tune the network on the classification task, during training, we randomly sample a number of positive proposals and a number of background proposals. And this becomes our batch. And remember, all of this will be resized to 227 cross 227. Using this, we fine-tune our network on the categories present in the detection dataset plus the background class and train the entire network using cross-entropy loss. There is one other aspect which we need to consider here, which is, what if we have two ground truth boxes with which a proposal overlaps? So let's say this image and these two are ground truth boxes. Then with this proposal, and here assume it has greater than 0.5 overlap with both the ground truth boxes. Then we'll obviously select this as a positive proposal. But the class associated with it will be the class of the ground truth box that has higher overlap with the proposal. So here, if that's the mirror, then this positive proposal will have a ground truth class label of mirror. This entire fine tuning is beneficial even if all classes are common between our detection dataset and ImageNet. Because up until now, the network would have not seen these warped images. So fine tuning allows the network to improve its ability to recognize these warped images as well. After this training, we have a network that does the classification of region proposals into background or some class present in our dataset. Then we throw off this classification layer again and now use the FC layers output as the feature representation of proposals. As the final step, we now train a linear SVM for each class which takes this feature representation and learns to classify whether it's a positive instance of that class or negative instance. If you know SVMs, great. But if you don't, then just think of this as a linear classifier, learning a decision boundary in the 4096 dimensional space. So the person class SVM is going to learn to use these features to classify the proposal as person or not person. Note that the deep network is not updated and is frozen during this stage. 
Here also, we need to understand how do we find whether a proposal is positive or negative for this class. Unlike previous step, here the authors do it a bit differently. For labeling the ground truth for training class KSVM, the positive label is only assigned to the actual ground truth box with label K. And negative label is assigned to proposal boxes with less than 0.3 overlap with all ground truth instances of class K. Also, this SVM is trained with hard negative mining, which essentially just means that you give more priority to examples that the network is finding hard to classify correctly, rather than those that are easy for it. So here it could be that the network finds it hard to classify proposals with greater than 0 but less than 0.3 overlap as negative instances. To compare this with the earlier step, in fine-tuning stage, we used a threshold of 0.5 and did not ignore any proposals, whereas in SVM, proposals with IOU greater than 0.3 are ignored. Just to illustrate this difference further, for this image, and let's focus only on person class as of now, so this will be our ground truth box. And these were all the selective search return proposals. During fine tuning, these were the positive labeled proposals for person class. And these are a sample of background proposals, as in those with less than 0.5 overlap. Here I've removed all negative proposals which have zero overlap just for clarity. For SVM, this is the only guy with positive label. And these are all the negative proposals with less than 0.3 overlap. Again, here I have removed those with zero overlap. We'll soon get into reasons for this difference, but if we had to summarize everything that we have done till now, then first we trained a CNN on ImageNet, fine-tuned this CNN with resized proposal on the detection classes, and this was our definition for getting proposals with labels as non-background and background classes. Then we train a SVM for each class to use this learned feature representation and classify proposals as positive for class K or negative for class K. And now, this was our definition of getting the labels. So there are two things that could be a bit unclear at this point. Why have these different definitions of ground truth labels during fine tuning stage and SVM? And second, why even have this SVM step? At step two, after fine tuning, we have a network that given a region proposal, can classify it as a category that we are interested in or background. Then why not leave it there and call that as RCNN? The authors give details of this in the appendix of the paper. They mention that rather than having the three steps, like we have seen up till now, they first just had SVM trained on the feature representation of proposals by a network trained only on ImageNet. So no fine tuning. And at that point, for SVM, this definition of positive and negative labels with 0.3 threshold ended up being the best on validation set. Then when they added the fine tuning stage at start, they had the same definition of positive and background, but that gave worse results compared to the definitions that they ended up using. They believe that it's because of the limited data present during fine tuning. Specifically, based on the SVM definition of positives, for this image, we would only get one positive proposal. But if we use the greater than 0.5 threshold, we would get a higher number of proposals that the network sees as positives. They feel this increase in positive examples is important to fine tune the entire CNN and prevent overfitting at that stage. Then comes the second question that okay, so why not skip SVM? And again, the authors mention that they tried that as well but it also ended up giving worse results. So during fine tuning, the network would see all these as positive instances for class person. This does not allow precise localization and the network would treat all these images as same, which might not even lead to the best discriminative capability. Like as a hypothetical example, it could be the case that the network just discriminates person and non-person using presence of hands. Then both these proposals during inference time would actually be the same for the network. In contrast, the SVM would only see this as the positive for person class. Now you could argue that just by this also, there is a possibility that the network uses the same discriminating criteria as before. But remember SVM is also trained using hard negative mining. 
So assuming the hard negatives to be proposals with something like 0.2, 0.3 overlap, these are the examples that the SVM is forced to classify correctly as not a person. So it will end up learning better discriminating features. Whereas during fine tuning stage, the background class proposals are randomly sampled from a pool of all background proposals. So from the perspective of learning which proposal is a person and which may be just a part of a person, the SVM strategy would be better. We used a very specific example here, but hopefully it gave some intuition regarding this. Now having said all of that, we could also do hard negative mining during the fine tuning stage. Maybe that will help and not have us use SVM at all. Or maybe some other modification. The authors indeed mentioned the possibility of this, that further tweaks might remove the need for SVM training completely. And once we get into fast and faster RCNN, we'll see that. So as of now, we are able to take region proposals and classify them as category of interest or background. But we are still at the mercy of the kind of proposals that we get from selective search. So if one of the regions that we get is this, we are in a great position to predict an accurate box. But if this is the best proposal that we get, then there is really nothing that we can do. We have to live with this localization error in our predicted box. To reduce these localization errors and make the predicted proposal box more tightly fit the object, the authors add another component to RCNN. This is called class specific bounding box regressor. And it is really just a linear regression model that uses the selective search proposed region coordinates and transforms them into new box coordinates. Let's see how we do that. Assume we have this proposed box. Then we use the coordinates of this box to get these four values, which is the XY coordinate of the center of proposal box and its width and height. We do a similar thing for the ground truth box and get these four values. The authors then parameterize the transformation from P to G in this fashion, where these are the parameters of transformation. We can rewrite this and now these values are the targets that our linear regression model is going to learn to predict. For training this model, the authors take the pooling layer features for a proposal and feed it through linear layers and train these using MSE and regularization to predict the transformation parameters. Note that these layers are class specific. So you would have different set for person, different set for car and so on. Then during inference, given a proposal with some non-background class prediction, we use these FC layers to get the predicted parameters. And post that, simply use the transformation to get the new predicted box. For training this, again, we need to specify what ground truth is to be used for what proposals. Because there is no point trying to transform a box that is far off from the actual ground truth box. For this, the authors assign each proposal to the ground truth box with which it has maximum overlap, but only if the overlap is greater than 0.6, which they reach using validation. Otherwise, that proposal box is not even used for training the regressor. Again, remember this process of training bounding box regressors is done for each class and we get class specific bounding box regressors. After all the different stages of RCNN, when we see the detection outputs for this image, and here let's add another person. So for this image, when we see the detection outputs, we would get something like this. All these boxes are good predictions because they do contain a valid object within them. But because of the large number of proposals and the bounding box regressor, we would see multiple detection predictions for the same object. But we don't want that. We want one box per unique object. So we apply NMS or non-maximum suppression, which is common in object detection and it just aims to suppress or filter out redundant boxes. Let's see how it works. These are all our predicted boxes prior to NMS. We first separate prediction instances by class because NMS is going to be performed separately for each class. We then use some measure to estimate the quality of box, which is the confidence score. And here we'll use the predicted class probability as the confidence score. So the output of our SVM. Let's just put in some random values. 
Then for each class, we sort the instances based on this confidence score. And now we start building our actual predicted box list. Let's do first for the person class. We select the highest confidence box and filter out all boxes that have high overlap with this box. And because of sorting, they'll obviously have lower confidence. The overlap here will again be computed using IOU. And let's say we use a threshold of 0.5. So all these boxes will be removed. These two still remain because of their overlap being 0. Now again we pick the highest confidence box from the remaining predictions. And repeat by removing all boxes which have high overlap with this one. Which means for person class, we output just these two detections. We do the same for the car class. We pick the highest confidence box and remove all which have high overlap. Here, every other box will have high overlap with this one and hence all of them will be removed. This is how NMS will reduce the redundancy in the box predictions and we would finally output just three detection boxes for this image. Let's now look at the results the authors end up achieving with RCNN. The typical metric we use in object detection is MAP, which is short for Mean Average Precision. I had earlier thought of talking about MAP in this video itself, but it would have made this video much longer since I wanted to cover MAP in detail. So I'll do it in the next video. If you know about MAP, great, but for now we'll just use the word accuracy instead. So if you don't know about MAP, it's fine. Hopefully after the next video, you will have a complete understanding of it. But know that wherever I use accuracy, I mean MAP. And higher the MAP is, the better performance it represents. Let's look at all the steps of RCNN and how the accuracy changes with those steps. The first result that the authors provide is without the fine-tuning step. So we train a CNN on ImageNet, get feature presentation of proposals returned by selective search, and then train a SVM on this representation and post that NMS. This gives us an accuracy of 44.7 and this is on VOC 2007 test set. After adding the fine tuning stage, the accuracy bumps up to 54.2, where now we fine tune the CNN on the resized proposals and the classes that are present in the detection dataset. Then after adding the class specific bounding box regressor, the accuracy further jumps by 4% to 58.5. And finally, instead of using LXNet, the authors experiment using VGG, which has higher accuracy on ImageNet, but also higher parameters. This further bumps up the accuracy to 66, but this also comes up with a trade-off of higher compute time. When you compare RCNN results with other previous methods, you will see that there is significant improvement in terms of detection accuracy that RCNN is able to achieve. So this was all the important aspects of RCNN that I wanted to cover in this video. Hopefully you got some basic understanding of it and even object detection in general. In the next video, we are going to talk about MAP and look at its implementation and even look at an implementation of IOU and NMS. And post that, we'll get into fast and faster RCNN. We'll only be implementing faster RCNN out of these three, since that is the one that's commonly used. Thank you so much for watching this video right till the end and hope you have an amazing day.